All right, uh, welcome once again. Thanks for joining in for the worship ministry session. Uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have, uh, the privilege that we have to learn from your word. Lord, I pray that you will continue to pour out your wisdom uh, and your knowledge over us, Lord. Uh, Holy Spirit, um, the word says you are the spirit of revelation. I pray that you would open up our hearts, our eyes to see the wonder of who you are. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Um, so last week was a holiday uh, due to a, a public government holiday here in India. We were celebrating our Independence Day. Uh, but the class of the session before that, we started off the worship ministry course with uh, learning about Abraham and how he was known as the man of altars, um, right? So we kind of, we saw, uh, just to do a qu very quick recap of what we covered in the uh, in the last session, uh, we learned about altars, basically, and uh, we looked at the life of Abraham, his journey, his journey of faith, uh, you know, from where God called him out of the land that he was in. Uh, he, he comes from a polytheistic uh, worldview, so to say, uh, then he was being called to monotheism. That means there's only one God, and he, and he had to leave his family, his father, everything. It just takes, brings his wife along and his nephew. Um, just goes uh, because God told him to go and didn't really know where. And along the way, we see the progression of his life and his life of intimacy, his walk of faith, go deeper uh, you know, with God. And along the way, we happen to see that he builds altars. And... Um, and altars, as we learned, uh, is a place where death happens. Uh, it was it was a place of sacrifice. It was a place where bloodshed would be there, uh, and it was it is a place uh, altar where two worlds collide. The two worlds. There's a collision of uh, you know the the kingdom of God and and our kingdom here, and there's a, one world invading. It's uh, you know that. That's where humanity meets with the divinity. There's a divine exchange that is happening uh, at the altar. Uh, and altar is, is it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. You know, one of the things that we see, uh, um, you know, when Adam and Eve uh, sinned, right, um, they covered themselves with the leaves, the Bible says. Uh, they didn't know that the leaves would dry and wither off. And then it goes on to say that God uh, covered them with the skin of an animal. That means in the process, the blood was shed. It doesn't go into great detail, but you could imagine and you can see that God is showing that the wages of sin is death. That's what's supposed to happen. But he performed for himself the first sacrifice. And, uh, and somewhere along the way, he must have built an altar that Adam would have seen. Okay. And looking at that, I mean, so Bible doesn't go into great detail, right, about uh, all of these things. It just says Adam, you sinned, and then goes on to say that God covered them with the, uh, with the skin of the animal and whatnot. But, but you can imagine, uh, right, all of this, for sacrifice to happen, there must have been an altar that is built, and, uh, and Adam must have see must be seeing all of these things and hence imparted that later or taught that later to Cain and Abel and hence Abel also goes on to build an altar and you know offer up sacrifices isn't it um, and so altars are a beautiful beautiful thing we can uh, talk about it for a long time but uh, we saw that Abraham was known among the many things that he is known uh, he was known as the man of altars um, and then towards the end of that session, uh, we saw that God is not only expecting us to build altars where we come to a place of sacrifice, but he is, uh, and we saw that in conclusion in Romans 12, 1, that he is also asking us to be on the altar. All right, don't just build a, an altar for yourself and expect something magical to happen by saying, uh, you know, as Paul cries out, I beseech, therefore I beseech to you, brethren, offer yourself as a living sacrifice okay uh, in the old testament uh, you know there is the offering that you give and the person that is giving is will be known as the offerer isn't it um, so if you put an offering in your church or whatever uh, you know you take the money uh, and you put it okay so that 
that is the offering, uh, but you are the offerer. But towards the, you know, the conclusion of that, uh, from the last session, we see that God is not just asking you to be the offerer, but is also asking you to be the offering. Um, right, so that was uh, just a very quick recap uh, of um, everything that we could learn, and we could delve uh, much more deeper and st just study about the altars of Abraham a little bit more deeper. But then, uh, the, the just is enough. A brief understanding of that is enough. Uh, what I'd like to do today um, is just to share uh, how worship uh, service would have happened in the Old Testament. Um, right, so. Be now, Old Testament is huge, uh, from Genesis to Malachi. A lot of things happen. Uh, the timeline is huge. The years between <laughs> Genesis uh, and all the way to Malachi is, is a lot, isn't it? And but it does. The Old Testament does not give us an exact blueprint, right, of how the worship of ancient Israel happened. But however, we see that people built altars. In Genesis, we see the altars were built, and then we come to Exodus, and then we see that God gives Moses the blueprint. Uh, we'll study about the tabernacle of Moses uh, in a later session, just a little bit, uh, and we will also study about the tabernacle of David, uh, you know, a little bit later. Uh, so there was the tabernacle of Moses, tabernacle of David, the altars were there. Uh, and then after David came, the Temple of Solomon, that was... Um, so that's what I'd like to look at a little bit to, uh, for now, um, is uh, just go through a few scriptures and see how worship or the service in general uh, happened uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, because the temple that Solomon built... Um, let me just sh see if I can share. Uh, if, This is just an image. Um, it, it, this is a, a design that was made by uh, a person, I forget. Uh, it, this is from the 1800s, uh, and it is in a museum uh, in, in, in the UK somewhere. Um, so, And I found this image. And there are multiple images of the person who designed this particular model of the Temple of Solomon. Um, but it's just a, such a small scale, but you can just uh, look at it, the grandeur of it. Um, you can kind of imagine, um, right? And we can go through the Book of Chronicles and everything, and you can read about um, you know, the materials that Solomon got to build this temple from different regions and parts of the world. Um, it, it's just amazing. It's just wonderful. But so the temple that Solomon built was a common, a, a place of corporate worship. It was, um, it was the place for the people of Israel. Uh, you know, I was glad when they said to me, come, let us go to the house of the Lord. It was, uh, you know, they were excited to meet there. That was one place they would go, uh, you know, to worship, to honor God, to offer up sacrifices. Uh, it was, it was just a wondrous, wondrous thing, um, right? So I'll just stop sharing this. Um, that was just to give us an idea of what what the temple kind of would have looked like. Okay. Um, but here's the thing. Um, so in your notes, if you follow along, uh, I think I'm in page nine. Yeah, I think you're on page nine. Just, let's just look at some of the scriptures, uh, you know. Let's look at... Um, from Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 5, we are again going to just go back and read a few scriptures from the life of David and how he began to organize it, and we'll learn about it in detail much later. But then, just to give us a context of, you know, from the tabernacle of David and the transitioning into the temple. Um, so Second Samuel 6, 5 <clears throat> says that the Ark of the Covenant was being brought to Jerusalem, and David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments. Um, made of fir wood and with lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. Um, so it begins to give us an idea that okay, during the service, there's uh, there was a lot of instruments that was being used, uh, 
most of it I have not seen or experienced <laughs> playing it. Has anybody seen a liar? Harp I have seen, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, David and all the house of Israel. In other words, uh, another translation says the entire, the, all the nation of Israel were celebrating before the Lord. Celebrating before the Lord. Now, if you remember from the first year, uh, the Hebrew word for praise and celebration uh, is what? To rave, to boast. What's the Hebrew word? Shabak. Sorry, JB? Was it Shab Shabak? Shabak, yeah. But with more phlegm. <laughs> Shabak. Yeah, I already have. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, there was, they were boasting, they were raving, they were, you know, the, what they were doing is Shabak. Right before the Lord, um, so you see, their audience was very clear. Uh, Psalm ninety-five is so clear about it. Is it come, let us sing to the Lord. Right? It doesn't say let us sing to the worship leader or or whoever or any other individual. It's very clear that their audience was very clear. Let us sing to the Lord. They were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments okay and i'm sure there were more to it but let's let's go on okay uh, first chronicles 16 verse 4 to 6 um, it says david he appointed some of the levites as ministers before the ark of the lord even to celebrate again shapak and to thank and praise the lord god of israel right Asaph the chief, and the second to him, Zechariah, then Jael, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Metatiah, Eliab, Benaniah, Obed-Edom, and Jael with musical instruments, harps, lyres. Also Asaph played loud sounding cymbals, and Benaniah and Jehaziel the priest blew trumpets continually before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Um, now, what I want to do is, um, you know, we as I just don't want us to read a bunch of scriptures, uh, you know, because you can do that at home as well, and I, you, you know, you already do that. But I want us to just uh, dig a little deeper and think about the scriptures that we are reading. Okay, so in the scriptures that we just read, um, what kind of stands out to you? Pastor, but my name is not there in the verse. Why should I read it? Now that I've mentioned that, uh, most of us are rereading the verse. <laughs> so uh, I know what's happening, guys. Behind the veil, although I cannot see. <laughs> right, what's what, what's some of the thing that's kind of standing out? Okay, Jafina here is saying all kinds of instruments. Okay. Go on. Please feel free to unmute and speak. What what kind of stands out? Aon, Roseland, Leah, Anita, and Silatoli. What's happening, guys? What kind of stands out in that verse for you? G 
Chippy, anything? Worship leaders in the order that God has set. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, this, yeah, worship leaders, the, uh, as in from the Levitical priesthood, okay, so the gist was immediately what we begin to see is uh, that there was order, as you mentioned. I think that's a very key word. Uh, as we So this course, we begin to learn a little bit of the theology of the worship ministry, worship, uh, at the initial stages, and then we go... Uh, we shift our focus towards the most administrative part of worship ministry. Okay, and uh, administrative, in other words, is simply uh, is bringing some order, a, a system in place, right? And so we see that uh, David beginning to do this. So he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the Lord. Why? Because he must have done his homework. He learned the hard way, and you know that. The Levites uh, are the priesthood tribe, and a lot of the responsibilities were given to them, right, to minister before the Lord and whatnot. So he begins to bring an order, a system. Uh, you know, he ad begins to administer. Okay, this is your responsibility. This is your responsibility. This is your responsibility. Let's, it's not like, okay, let's all come together and, you know, do something uh, without any uh, order or system. So that kind of st stands out, okay? Uh, let's go, go on. First Chronicles 25, verse 1, uh, it says, Moreover, David and the commander of the army set apart for the service from the sons, some of the sons of Asaph and of Heman and Jeruthun, who were to prophesy with lyres, harps, and cymbals. Again, we see that continuing. Um, now, in First Chronicles chapter 25, we'll again look into at least the half of that chapter in, in, a, in a later session. Uh, but the first chronicles chapter 25 is the is like a more of fully it, it's the tabernacle of david it is in its final form okay um the system is everything is in place is everything is running smoothly uh but uh, can someone read second chronicles 5 12 to 14 what uh what is mentioned there uh in your notes second chronicles chapter 5 verse 12 to 14. someone please unmute and uh, and read that verse all the Levitical singers, Esaph, Haman, Jadatun, and their sons of kinsmen, clothed in fine linen, with cymbals, harp, and lyres, standing east of the altar, and with them 120 priests blowing trumpets in unison with the trumpeters and singers, were to make themselves heard with one voice to praise and to glorify the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice, accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and when they praise the Lord, saying, He indeed is good for His loving kindness is everlasting. Then the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Amen. Thank you, JP. Okay, guys. Now, uh, yeah, please share some of the things that stands out uh, in that verse for you. One voice stood one together, voice. stand in one accord. Yeah. Yeah. One voice, the unity, one accord. Okay. Thank you. Subhashish, Roslyn. Uh, we Don't see I... that uh, during the worship, the the house of the Lord was filled with the cloud, okay. so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. So during uh, the worship, we see the presence of God in the midst of them. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, JP, were you saying something? Were yeah, I was saying 120 priests blowing yeah. trumpets in unison. Yeah. Priests blowing in unison is another maybe picture of unity. Uh, yeah. 
Yes, and yes. also praising the Lord, uh, not talking about the circumstance, praising the Lord, saying, He is good for His love and kindness is everlasting. You know? Yeah. I mean, that seemed like a very famous song in the Old Testament, no? <laughs> song did, songs did not go more than three lines, two lines. Yeah. What else, guys? Someone else? Anybody else? I think God was so pleased that He decided to come in His fullness. Yeah. With His glory. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 But I mean, this is so much. Uh, you know, we see now we've uh, you know we've shifted to Second Chronicles chapter twenty-five from First Chronicles, uh, and then they've they've moved to the uh, you know the, to the temple. So. And then it goes on to say, I want to read that again. Levitical singers, Asaph, Him, and Jerathan, and their sons and kinsmen. Look at the detail. It says, it goes on to say, clothed in fine linen. That means they, they didn't come in wearing whatever they felt like wearing. Right? Uh, even that mattered uh, to them uh, with instruments. Um, standing east of the altar. Um, you know, all of this we don't have time to dwell into, but uh, any time a specific direction uh, or information is given, uh, a good way to study the Bible is ask yourself, why? Why is that mentioned? Why is standing east of the altar mentioned? Why, why not north, south, or west? Okay, um, so I leave that to you to discover. Okay, it says they wove fine linen with instruments. They were standing east of the altar and with them 120 priests blowing trumpets in unison okay uh, now has anybody seen an orchestra uh, i mean uh, like a uh, 140 piece orchestra uh, 120 with the all the violins and you know the timpanis and the drums and have, have you guys seen at least an image or in TV? Yes? An orchestra? Okay, let me see if I can find some image uh, which uh, uh, image wor image worthy of sharing. <laughs> no. Wait, I'm, sorry, guys, just give me one moment, okay? I'm seeing if there's any image that's worthy of sharing, but uh, what's happening? Okay, found something. Just, just give us an idea, okay? Because uh, all right. So this is uh, at least 120 uh, piece orchestra, as you see it. Okay. Um, now, in the front, to the left of okay, the person standing here with that baton, or you know, it's called he is the conductor. To his left, right in the front, we have the first violins, and at the back you'll have the second violins, and as they come, uh, you know. Behind them will be the violas, an instrument that is bigger than um, the violins that usually plays the alto parts. Um, and then there's the cello uh, that will usually, and the contrabass that will play the bass parts of the music. So there you have the strings instrument, uh, a string section in itself. You know, there are at least, there itself on 40 people are there. Uh, and then to his right, to the conductor's right, you see the woodwinds, like the flute and the clarinet and the oboes, the contrabass. And so to the right, you'll find the woodwinds. Uh, now you see the saxophone also, they may, you know, they're covered in like a brass or whatever. They're considered to be wood uh, woodwinds because they have a piece of wood, they blow into it. It's called the reed. Okay. So 
And then right in front of the conductor, you have the percussion section, uh, the timpanis, the drums, the marimbas, the kalimbas, the vibraphone, and all the drum section and the cymbals and whatnot. Now, uh, and then way at the back, you see the brass section. You see the, like, uh, at least the three tubas, four tubas. And uh, there will you there you can't see everybody, but there'll be a French horn. French horn is uh, the one that kind of looks small, kind of curled up in it. That's called a French horn. Trombone is you've seen people push this thing in the front. That's a trombone and whatnot. So why I'm share why I want to show this picture is the brass section of an orchestra is the loudest section of the orchestra. They can easily overpower just four trumpets. Okay, so the conductor most of the time will always keep the volume in check. Okay, when the brass section have to play an instrument, a piece of music, they'll say, okay, control, because they can easily overpower the entire orchestra. Just four to five trumpets can outsound the entire orchestra. I'm talking about the string section, the woodwinds, the drums, the percussion section, everything. Now, when you look at the verse, it talks about 120 priests playing trumpets in unison. Talk about mind being blown, everything being blown, right? <laughs> uh, blowing the trumpet in unison that must have been like quite a scene just to witness that uh just to be there uh it would have been loud uh, that's an understatement uh you know and then imagine so trumpets are being you know being blown in unison when the trumpeters and and singers were to make themselves heard <laughs> So the singers had to sing on top of this 120 uh, priests blasting the trumpets. Now, it doesn't really tell us how many singers were there. But they had to make themselves heard with one voice to praise and to glorify the Lord. I mean. You, we need to imagine, isn't it? Uh, what a party it must have been! It, you know, what an event! What uh, what a joy it must have been for people to just come together and to worship this one God, right? And they just and they sang, "He indeed is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting." Well, I, I, I think there's so much of power in unity, um, and that is an understatement, uh, right? Everybody's heart set, fixed on the Lord. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, it would have been a beautiful, beautiful sight. Okay, uh, is there anything else you want to add uh, or share that kind of stands out in that verse for you? Nothing? Okay. Let's move on. So at the bottom, there's another verse, Second Chronicles chapter 29, verse 25 to 30. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 29, verse 25 to uh, 30. Can someone read that, please? Speaks of the worship to God, instigated by Hezekiah. He then stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with symbols, with halves, with lyres, according to the command of David, and of Gad the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet. For the command was from the Lord through his prophets. The Levites stood with the musical instrument of David, and the priests with uh, trumpets. And Hezekiah gave the order to offer the burnt offering on the altar. When the burnt offering began, the song to the Lord also began with the trumpets accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. While the whole assembly worshipped, the singers also sang, and the trumpet sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. 
Now at the completion of the bond of rings, the king and all who were present with him bowed down and worshipped. Moreover, King Hezekiah and the officials ordered the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. So they sang praises with joy and bowed down and worshipped. Amen. Thank you, Subhashish. Um, okay, yeah, so you know the drill now. You know the drill. Uh, Anita, I'm going to start picking out names, okay? And by the way, if you don't know, uh, this is later going to be uploaded on YouTube and e-learning platform and all, and all of them. Uh, we we'll are waiting for you to unmute and speak. So, unmute and speak. <laughs> What kind of stands out in the verse that we've just read? For you, what stands out for you? Uh, yes, Lavega, please go ahead. According to my simple modular of Bringata, it looks like a for true worship, there must, there must be, it is time bound. It has when to stop, what follows, and when to end. You don't just go on and on and on and on like that you are driven by the Spirit. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Abel. All right, thank you for sharing. Um, who else? Rosalind, would you like to? Um, I just want, okay. The thing which stood out to me was that here also, I see order and everything was so organized. And also, you know, the Levites, they sing praises to God with words of, uh, you know, like with joy. There's so much of joy and the uh, the way they sing praises to God. I can picture it, and I mean, just I'm having this mental picture, and it was such a great, awesome scene. That's what yeah. I'm getting it. Yeah. 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 Thank you for sharing that. So, yes. It's order. Yeah. Order is still the key element in worship. Yeah. Responsibilities are also shared accordingly, absolutely, yes. Unmute. Um, we see. Okay, so Okay, so uh, I just liked how uh, it says. Um, they started according to the command of David. Like uh, there, there is some listening. Even they are looking up to someone to start it. Uh, that's one of the thing that uh, that stood out to me. And also how it says when the burnt offering began, they started uh, the thing. And then until the burnt offering was completed, uh, they just did it. And just imagining itself, it's like. Uh, I mean, I used to listen to this uh, choir songs during Christmas, and it just gives us a goosebump uh, singing all of them singing together. And just imagining how it will be like when everyone just sings together, and when it's all over, we all go down together. Uh, I could just feel that happiness just by reading it. But yeah, that's one of it. Great. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Subhashish, you had something to share. Uh, we see that um, in verse somewhere actually while the whole assembly worship, the singers also sang and the trumpet sounded. Uh, mm -hmm. Though the, this uh, maybe now we can say the worship team through this uh, started. Okay, they sing songs. Okay, maybe the trumpet uh, the trumpet sounded. Uh, but we see that maybe sometimes they stopped, and uh, during that time maybe the whole assembly there worshiping. And uh, maybe I see that uh, the, the singer also sang. That means many times actually, nowadays uh, what I think, 
many times as uh, singers or the people the they lead the time of worship they think we are leading people but we i think uh, here we see that the they are sometimes they are quiet and uh, the whole assembly they are worshiping and the singers also sang and trumpet sounded so that means actually we have to believe it's not the singers they are leading people to christ but it is all about god its presence so though they are quite sometimes but these people they are worshiping uh continuously and these leaders maybe these singers they are also singing and they are maybe using trumpets or maybe uh, some other actual instruments so we have to believe it's not all about we but it's all about god who is leading people yeah thanks uh, shubhashish okay let's just look at the verse again okay um so by now we need to understand that david is dead and gone all right um second chronicles 29 so a lot has happened um so solomon beyond solomon and now hezekiah is in charge and, and so he hezekiah then stationed the levites in the house of the lord with cymbals with harps and with lyres now why is this important so far is now even after david is kind of passed on dead and gone the order is still in place why i say that is it says the heathen station levites in the house of the lord now he's learned from david that's how he set it up right with harps and with lyres according to the command of david right and of gad the king's seer and of nathan the prophet for the command was from the lord through his prophets okay this was lord's command uh, and david followed that and he's instilled that into his team members and so the next leader generation after generation will follow what was instilled by the lord what was commanded by the lord right so the order and the system is still going on uh, the levites stood with the musical instruments of david and that goes on to say that david invented musical instruments he built new instruments that was not heard of right he, he imagine uh, uh do you, does anybody know who invented um, or designed um, built up the first piano okay so you know if you study music history i as it shows me right I, if i remember my history right it's bartolomeo cristofari um is the person who first designed and built the piano uh in in i think the 17th century because the 16th century is what we known as the baroque era it was play, uh, where the harpsichord was a very famous instrument and um and in the 17th century the classical in, um, is an era of the classical music that's where the piano is built and the 18th century is known as the romantic era where the piano became a better instrument it could add more dynamics to it and what not so th- why i'm saying that is inventing one instrument or designing and building one instrument uh which the world has never seen is a big deal here it goes on to say that with the instruments that means they would build multiple instruments of uh you know um just to worship god and we don't know of all the instruments that he started but it's such a great deal isn't it and the priests with the trumpets goes on there so now that everybody is in place uh, where now now that the worship team is standing where they're supposed to stand now that the singers are placed where they're supposed to be placed and everything is in place and what not then the senior pastor gives the order <laughs> to offer the burnt offering on the altar right when the burnt offering began the song to the lord also began okay the song to the lord also began with the trumpets accompanied with the instruments of david king of israel now while the whole assembly worshiped the singers also sang and the trumpets sounded now again with the previous verse where we said one accord unison everybody with just one focus uh, you know singing to the audience of one um, And so while the whole assembly worshiped the singers also sang the trumpet sounded all this continued until the burnt offering was finished now we don't know how long it was burning for it doesn't say that it doesn't say 15 minutes 30 minutes 1 hour 2 hours 3 hours we don't know could have taken longer right we we just don't know 
but it must have been longer otherwise it wouldn't have been mentioned over here all this continued until the burnt offering was finished and they didn't stop that means everybody were excited they were shabakhing yada toda everything was happening zamar uh, you know all of that is happening until the burnt offering was finished now at the completion of the burnt offerings you think that the service is done you say bye now have a good day have a good sunday uh, enjoy your sunday with your families and a good nap you think that the service is done after the burnt offering was finished but no now at the completion of the burnt offerings the king and all who were present with him bowed down and worshipped they didn't want to stop but then again another point there that kind of stands out for me is the king was still there the head the leader was still there it was important that the king the leader was there right leading by example talk about that isn't it the king and all, all who were present with him bowed down and worshiped moreover the service is not done yet. King Hezekiah and the officials ordered the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. All right, they were singing a song. Okay, all of this is done. All right, let's sing some more song. Let's sing some songs of David and Asaph. And so they sang praises with joy and bowed down and worshipped. Um, so what I want to leave us with uh, this session is worship in the Old Testament, uh, at least in the second, uh, in the first temple, in the Temple of Solomon, which, which, but it began with the Tabernacle of David, and everything was just a place of celebration, was just a place of joy. Um, you know, again, I say this, uh, and you know, like what John, uh, John Paul's shared that they sang that he is good. Uh, and his loving kindness endures forever was not based on their circumstances or what they were going through, right? So coming back to Psalm 95, it says, "Sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, and and shout for joy." Joy. So shouting. Think about shouting. Shouting does not have a vocabulary, isn't it? It's just shouting, screaming, and whatnot. But then they're doing that with joy. Uh, you know, joy for most of the time we mistake and uh, we think that joy means happiness. Right? Happiness is temporary, but joy is the biblical definition or understanding of joy is an expression of faith. One of the expressions of faith is regardless of what my situation or circumstances, I'm going to shout for joy. Uh, because I think it's in, I'm not. Please correct me if I'm wrong. It's either Hebrews 11 or 12. Hebrew, I think it's 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, uh, for the joy that was set before him, talking about Jesus, he endured the cross. Right? For the joy that was set before him. And so this place, this, this act of worship in the Old Testament, when they were coming together as a corporate, uh, you know, there, it was a place of joy. It was a place with, where it was, everyone was filled with faith and every, everyone was expressing uh, their faith and, and worshipping, um, you know, God. Um, it, it would have been an awesome sight to behold. All right. Uh, does anybody have any thoughts or something that you want to share before we end the session? Okay, so we'll pause here um, and we'll come back after the break. Okay. Thank you.